Well, hey, everybody, welcome to our weekly ongoing coaching meeting. Glad all of you are here. We have a very special guest today uh, that many of you may not know personally, but I know you know of him. <laughs> you've heard his name for sure if you've read my book, and uh, you've heard his name, I'm sure, if you read Mission Frontiers or other books, people uh, reference him a lot because he is the director of global research with Beyond. And Justin, you can even do a longer intro when I when I turn it over to you because he does a lot more at Beyond than just that. Beyond, as you guys know, is a missions ascending agency and is helping to catalyze movements all over the world. He does research there. So Justin regularly regularly interacts with movement catalysts from around the world, uh, co helping them collect data so that they can figure out where the gaps are, where new movement engagements need to um, start, and just to help the movements uh, know what they're seeing, where they're seeing it, and how to see more of it. So Justin is very involved with movements. One thing uh, that you may not know is like if you get the latest mission frontiers or you see people giving the total active movements number, which I think Justin will share with us is now approaching 2,000. I think it's just under, maybe it's over now. I don't know. But Justin and his team, I think it beyond, and he works with researchers throughout movements worldwide, are what put this together and bring all this data together to help us know what's going on in the world so we can celebrate what God's doing and the movements that are happening. And again, and he may talk about this some, so we can figure out where the gaps are and where we need to get more movement engagement. So Justin, I mentioned his name even recently because he helped us with our data. So the data we just collected that I told you guys about a couple of weeks ago, he helped us know what to collect and how to collect it. And um, he, he said we did well our first time. I think we'll do better even next time. <laughs> and so um, he's great. So I asked Justin to come today and just share what is happening with movements globally. Like, and, and, and how, how we, I know we play a little small part. We've given him some data, but just what's going on around the world with respect to movements. So he's going to share that. And then the last thing I want to say before I turn it over to him is if you have questions for Justin, we'll stay longer today in the main session if we need to, because he's a wealth of information. If you have questions for him about movements, the statistics behind movements, where they're happening, where they're not happening, whatever questions you have as he's talking, if you'll post them in the chat, I'll try to filter through them. And once he's done with his presentation, feed him some of these questions. So that's the plan. Justin, let me turn it over to you. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, brother. We're glad to have you. Cool. Um, yeah, well, I am I am Justin Long. <laughs> uh, I'm Director of Research and Recruiting for Beyond both at the moment. I play both roles. Um, so I've, I've been with Beyond now for about 10 years. I've been in missions research since the very late 1980s, um, after my wife and I married in 1995, we went to work with the World Christian Encyclopedia, which is where I kind of teethed on mission research under David Barrett and Todd Johnson and some of the others. I've worked with most of the major global uh, databases around the world. Uh, it's where I basically found out that God can use people who love spreadsheets, and, and that's what I am. I'm a person who loves spreadsheets. And so, um, yeah, so... Uh, for the last, uh, since 2013 to 2015 is when I started really taking a kind of a keen interest in this thing that we, that we were hearing about called movements. And it was right prior to the two meetings that generated the 2414 coalition that I started gathering a significant amount of data on movements in the run up to that. Stan and Steve Smith, the late Steve Smith, um, helped me to uh, collect a lot of that initial data. And uh, that's where we found out that there weren't really 100, and 100, 120 movements as we thought. It was more like 500 at that point, which uh, was very surprising to a lot of people. And we've continued to collect information over the years. So that's mostly what I do these days is, besides my recruiting hat, my research hat is focused uh, on documenting movements around the world. So basically what I do is I connect a lot with the various movement families, and I'll talk about that a little bit later around the world. And uh, I usually go to anywhere between three and six international trips, meetings, conferences uh, of these movement leaders. In fact, I'm next week, I'm going to get on a plane and head to uh, a region, which I will not name right now, um, where I'm going to be doing a, uh, a helping a movement do a survey of some work that they have not previously they've they've been doing for a couple of years now but they haven't previously surveyed it so we're gonna 
we're going to find out just how expansive that new section of work that they're doing is. So I'll spend four days in one city and three days in another and meet uh, 100, 150 of their leaders and, and kind of talk through a lot of what they're doing and, and try to put some numbers on it. That's mostly what I do with my life. It's uh, I'm a max introvert who has been thrust into the world of coffee and tea and relationships with people and and trying to gel all those into spreadsheet numbers. And it's it's quite an interesting life that God has uh, allowed me and called me to, to uh, lead. So I am going to share my uh, screen here. Anyway, uh, one of my first jobs was working with a group called Ames, and I had to create a database while I was there of who was working where. And I had no idea where that initial, I thought I was just making it easier for myself to do my job of answering people's letters. I had no idea where that would lead, but it's led me on this long journey. Okay, let's try sharing my screen again. Yes, it's going to let me. Okay, here we go. So, um, and then let me pull this over here where I can see everybody's faces. And okay, so this is the dashboard. Uh, this is a, a presentation that I, I typically do. Uh, we update this uh, several times in a given year. Um, so this is one I, I, I give to uh, various places. So let me get through some, some quick assumptions for you first so that, we, so that you understand how this is done. First off, uh, I report what's reported to me. We don't just take spurious reports off the web of movements. Uh, or things in books or publicity materials. Basically, the, the reports have to be confirmed, uh, which means that the, anybody that I am uh, taking data from has been, somebody's been out to see them, somebody's talked to them, they're in a coaching relationship with someone, uh, where we are collecting information from them on an ongoing basis. There's about, like I said, about 40 families that we presently gather information from. I know that there's more out there that we don't yet have, so I usually tell people that what we've got here is the floor, not the ceiling. We're, we're fairly conservative in, in what we do. Secondly, uh, I am documenting and I am not assessing. So I aim to identify and describe movements. I am not assessing them uh, for anyone's particular theological position or uh, purity of movement or, or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I, I'm just aiming for a globally comprehensive data set of all the all the movements that are out there. Uh, many things tell me, many people tell me things as background, and then they're like, uh, but you can't tell anybody that. So my my uh, approach to that is that we don't share country or people specific information. Everything that we gather is summarized to regional and global levels with permission. This is really about the only way that this can actually happen because a lot of these movements are in very sensitive locations. They're, they're in very sensitive places and they just don't want that work among data out there for the whole world to know. So the goal of research and movements is not to tell everything we know and not to know everything. Our goal is to tell the general world that things are happening, which is what this dashboard does. Our primary goal is to serve the movements and tell them where the gaps are. That's really what we're trying to do. We work with various uh, regional networks to say, okay, Movement number one is working here. Movement number two is working there. Movement number three is working over there. And this little gap in the middle is where no one is working. And so you should send workers there. And that's what happens when we do that year in and year out. Uh, these movements send teams to the places that are not presently engaged. How we define a movement is at least four generations of churches in multiple streams growing and adding another generation in a timely fashion. Uh, size. So I don't use a size measure, but a lot of the people that report to me do. So by default, I kind of do use a size measure, and it's generally 100 churches and 1,000 believers. So another way that our numbers are very conservative is uh, uh, several of the movements don't report anything under 100 churches or 1,000 believers in their streams. So several of the movements have more stuff going on. They just don't report it until it reaches that thousand uh, believer threshold in that particular street. Usually it's bounded to a subcountry place like a province or a language or a people group or a city. So it's not uh, movement by country. It's more movement by province or movement by language in a given country. Those are the kinds of streams we look at. 
In fact, right now, what I'm trying to do is get all our data down to the district level, which districts within which provinces. So in the United States, that would be states and counties uh, is actually the level that I'm, I'm trying to get down to that I'm working on. We use the CPM continuum. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's basic seven point scale. Uh, level one is basically a, a team's there, it's engaged, it's trying to get some stuff done. Levels two through four are uh, different thresholds of generational fruit uh, that have not yet reached that movement stage. Level five is the movement stage where you've got consistent fourth generation churches, multiple streams, more generations being added. Level six is basically our, our category for uh, this movement is pretty much completely indigenous and, and most movements would reach this threshold at the same time that they reach the movement threshold. But um, it's basically, there's no need for outsiders. The outsiders, if they're there, they play, they play a very minimal supporting role. Uh, and then seven uh, means that movement is trying to start movements in other places. So they're actually intentionally sending teams out to nearby locations. And that's key to what we'll talk about at the very end of this particular presentation. So we're going to get into the numbers now. This is what everybody really loves. This is the part. So around the world at the moment, we are presently tracking, right knocking on 5,500 teams that are trying to uh, see something start. So for example, the teams that you guys have in the eLife network are in that number. The teams that Beyond has are in that number. The teams that all these various ministries have are, are in this number. So whenever we hear of an engagement, of a language or a province that becomes a team. Now, in all actuality, some of these engagements are multiple teams. So we don't necessarily go to that level of detail, but there's 54, 78 different engagements of teams. Of those, 1,965 are known to be, um, actually, I think it's 1967. I, I think this, I, I copied this presentation from a, from a slightly older presentation. So the correct number would be 67, but in any event, it's right there. It's 1965, 67, pretty close to 2000. We probably actually are over the 2000 line, but I want to be sure of that. I want to have a, a significant amount of data in before I do that, because when I trigger that 2000 line, there's going to be a lot of people who pay attention to that. So I'd, I'd like to be well over the 2000 line before I, I put that number out there. Um, so this is roughly the breakdown. Now, remember what I said about the CPM continuum. Level one, which is this uh, first column here, there's 1,775 teams at that level. That's that team level where it's they maybe have seen a little fruit, but it's probably not generational fruit yet. So they're, they're kind of just getting started. Fruit, this level two to four stage here in the middle, there's 1738 teams at that one. And that's where they're seeing generational fruit. They've got some momentum, but they haven't reached movement stage yet. And then 1965 are at that DMM stage from level five to level seven. The important thing about this particular graph, I think, is that this is that there's a time progression that occurs here. Um, the ones that are seeing fruit, the two to four stage, they are naturally progressing. In fact, we've already seen this over the last five years. They are naturally progressing toward that DMM stage. In fact, in the next you know, 12 to 18 months, several of these 1738 will slide into that DMM category because they're seeing fruit and they're growing and, and they're adding additional generations. So what we have here are two stages nearly a potential doubling right here in this chart right now in view. And that, that will be important. Keep, keep that in mind. That'll be important later on. There's two, there's nearly two doubles right here on this board alone without adding any additional work at the moment. Okay. So in all about 114 million disciples are in those movements. Okay, now these, this number is professing, not all of them are baptized. You know, uh, some movements take longer to baptize than others. Some baptize very, very quickly. Others decide to, you know, have a period of discipleship before they actually reach baptism. Different movements do things in different ways. So I'm always careful to say, if you're comparing this number to any number in other research, make sure you're comparing it to the professing number, not to the baptized number. Okay. So, so 114 million, which means that over 1% of the world's people 
the total world population are presently disciples in a rapidly re reproducing movement. I think we're, we're approaching 1.5% at this point, which is an incredible thing to think about. In our world today, and especially in the unreached world, one out of 100 people in the world are disciples in a rapidly growing movement. It's a fantastic number. Um, they are in 8.6 million churches, not seeker groups. So we're not even counting, you know, seeker groups, discovery groups, those initial, uh, do you want to form a group and, and read scripture together and, and discover who Jesus is? We're, we're talking actual churches at this point. Now, obviously, churches are made up of a mixture of um, seekers and, and baptized believers, but that, that's what that's what this number is. So that means that there are more churches in movements than there are in traditional denominations in the world today. Now, it's maybe a little apples and oranges because obviously house churches and small churches of, you know, 15 to 20 people in a movement is different from, say, a church of 200 to a church of 2,000 uh, in a denomination. But nevertheless, you know, there's a lot of denominations in the world that have house churches. You know, a lot of Chinese church, a lot of Chinese networks are all house churches. Uh, a lot of these other networks are all house churches. So house churches are, are not untraditional, so to speak. Uh, there, are, there are more churches in these movements than there are in, in any of the traditional denominations, or all the traditional denominations together, I should say. So there's about 14 disciples per church on average. Uh, this number varies by country between 14, 15, 20, something like that. There are a few very high security situations where this number will actually drop down to about, you know, even three to five to eight people, depending upon local laws about, you know, how many people can gather in a house for like a birthday party, let alone a, a house church meeting. Um, so it, it'll vary from place to place, but generally speaking around the world, it's about 14 to 15 people per church on average. And uh, the mean, if you take the total number of believers and divide by the total number of movements, you'll get about 50 to 60,000 disciples per movement on average. Now, a lot of movements are smaller. They're in the 1,000 to 10,000 range, and a handful of movements are quite large. The largest in the world that I, single movement that I know of is somewhere over 30 million believers in that particular movement. So we have a, a pretty large range, but it does appear that you can expect any typical movement to grow to a size of between 50 to 100,000 people, which is why when we're calculating the number of teams that are needed, we generally look at population segments and ask how many 50 to 100,000 population segments are there in this particular area. That's how many teams that we need because we can expect a movement to typically, once it gets moving over time, it can grow to this size. So this is the distribution of those movements out by world region. So the red bars are the level one teams that are getting started. Those green bars in the middle are the ones that are seeing some fruit and haven't reached movement altogether. And the dark blue bars to the right are the level five full movements. Now, a few things stand out here, of course, East Africa, West Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, these are the, and even Western Asia, these are the places where movements are really going quite strong. There are also the places where movements have been going the longest. Um, a lot of times, you know, people have said, well, you know, that movement, uh, movements, it, it can work over there, but it won't work here. And then they tried it here and lo and behold, it worked. And then someone else in a different place would say, well, well, it worked in those two places, but it won't work here. And then they tried it and lo and behold, it works. What this chart, it, it's interesting with this chart is there are now teens and fruit in every UN region of the world, with the exception of Polynesia. It's the only place where we haven't had teams and movements just yet. So this works everywhere. It's just that some places it's been going longer than others. That's the only difference between the total amount of fruit. It's not that some places are less responsive, it's that movements have been going there a lot later. In fact, you could make the argument that some of these are actually quite responsive, given that they've only been going for a little bit of time. Now, in Europe and the Americas, again, I don't comment on specific countries. I know somebody's going to ask me, and that's my standard answer. I don't comment on specific countries, but I will say 
that a lot of the activity that's presently happening in, in Europe and the Americas is amongst diaspora peoples. There is some activity, and I've been thrilled to see what the eLife Network is doing. I mean, I could, I could talk to you guys about what you're doing because you're you. Um, but, you know, this is one of the first really good examples of a network that is focused quite a bit, if not mostly, on what I would call the majority people of a particular region. It's not so much diasporas. It's trying to use movement to reach into the majority of people of a particular region. And that really doesn't happen very much in westernized cultures. Um, one of the reasons why um, it, this has worked so well, I think, in Africa and Asia is, uh, well, there's two reasons. The first reason uh, was told to me by a guy. He said, you know, they don't have anything to do at night except sit around and talk about what God's done for them. There's no television. There's no, you know, there's nothing to distract them. That's all, that's all they've got time to do. And when you're sick, there's no doctor to go to. You're going to be praying for God to do something for you. And you're going to see some miracles happen, the things you can't explain. And so, you know, why, why wouldn't it go very fast there? So that's one reason there's nothing to distract you. The second reason I think it works so well in African Asia is you have a lot of spiritually hungry people. You, uh, one of the things I've heard time and time again is that materialism kills uh, any hunger for God. So where you have, in fact, you know, when China was opening up, one of the big things people told me a lot was they were really concerned about the materialism. Persecution, they didn't worry about. Persecution helped grow the church. Materialism, they worried about a lot, you know, in, in the early days. So you have a lot of spiritually hungry people in these particular areas. Okay, moving along. Uh, this is the number of disciples in movements by region. Now, <laughs> elephant the room there is South Asia, of course. That's the that's the biggest, uh, by far, biggest grouping. But there are some other interesting bars. Those those individual bars here. Th this is 10 million people. So you know, Western Asia, Western Africa, they they are seeing significant numbers uh, coming to faith as a result of these particular movements. 222. Now, Joshua Project, if you go on their website, you'll see that all of the tens of thousands of people groups are, are divided into clusters that makes it easier. So there's 271 people clusters on the Joshua Project website. A cluster might be the Afar or the Somali peoples or the Turkic peoples or, or whatever. Um, 271 is a more manageable number than 17,000. 222 of the 271 clusters are engaged by teams. That gives you a sense of the ethnic uh, diversity and distribution of these movements. It's, it's, there's teams engaging across a broad spectrum of the world. So if you have prayed for movements to spread around the world, they well and truly have. That, that prayer has been answered. There are teams in every region of the world. There are movements in nearly every region of the world. Most of the world's uh, large clusters of peoples are presently being engaged. It's just amazing the spread that has happened uh, in the last few decades. Let's talk about the remaining tasks briefly. Out of 240 countries, 190 are engaged, 50 are not. Most of those 50 are you know, nominally Christian or post-Christian countries at the moment. Uh, there are seven and a half thousand languages in the world of those we know of a thousand or so that have been engaged. And that definitely is floor, not ceiling. We're still gathering some language information from some of the movements. 6.4 thousand are unengaged, but that number really is going to be much lower because um, there's a lot we don't know about linguistic engagement. Uh, a lot of the movements will tell you some of the big languages that they've engaged, but they don't always realize, you know, even some of the smaller languages that are naturally being engaged by workers on the ground that nobody really knows about, they're not necessarily reported up. So as a statement of progress, um, most mostly engaged some gaps, East Africa, much of West Africa, Central Asia, South Asia, Muslim Southeast Asia. If you're doing any work in those particular areas, you ought to be doing it in conjunction with stuff that's presently happening on the ground. Many engagements in fruit, but a lot more gaps would be a lot of East Asia, Buddhist Southeast Asia, and Western Asia. Uh, some engagement, mostly gaps, North Africa, the Turkic world, and then most of the Western world would be some engagement, lots of gaps that are left. So that's basically where we are right now.
Okay, so let me briefly talk about what's it going to take. What's it going to take to get from here to the 2414 goal, which was uh, a team in every uh, people in place by 2025. This is the increase in movements over time. It's not exponential right now, it's additive. Movements adding one by one by one by one. We haven't reached the point really, to, a lot of movements want to see movements start, but we haven't seen that exponential curve really kick off. We are seeing that the number of disciples in movements have grown explosively and exponentially over the past 35 years. So if you notice, you know, this 2010 number, you can see the doubling. You, you, can, you can see it right there. Right, that is a power law curve. That is the curve you want. That's the curve that every social media viral explosion fad, whatever. That's the curve they want to see. It's, that's a great curve. Okay. Now, if you take that curve and you show it logarithmically, everyone, stay with me. Um, each of these lines is a 10x growth. Right. So from one to 10, to 100, to 1,000, to 10,000, to 100,000. See, we're adding a zero with each of the lines, okay? So you can see now an interesting progression over the last 35 years. 30 years of data show us four 10X growth points where the movements as a whole in the world grew by 10 times, okay? The first one here in 2000, the second one here in 2005, the third one here in 2015, and the fourth one we crossed it, we call it 2025. We've actually already crossed this line, but we're counting it as we're doing five-year increments on the chart to keep things nice and smooth. Okay, so you can see these four-year, uh, these four growth points. So early growth, faster. So from 1995 to 2000, we did a 10X. Then from 2000 to 2005, we did another 10X. And then we slowed down a bit. 2000 to 2015, we did the third 10X. 2015 to 2025, we did the fourth 10X. So earlier it was about every five years, now it's about every 10. Okay, so for this entire period, that means movements as a whole in the world have averaged a 23% average annual growth. They were roughly doubling in size every three and a half years, even at the slowest point. Now, bear in mind, world population grew not 23%, but 1.18% or thereabouts. Okay, and traditional Christianity grew about 1.17% to 1%. So traditional Christianity has been flatlined against total world population growth, whereas these movements have been growing phenomenally fast, rapid. That's, and and they, that's because they've got multiplication built in. So let's assume that what has happened over the last three decades in the midst of enormous wild cards will be the most likely minimum growth for the next two decades. Now, I, I you know, I, I don't, I've got an article that's gonna be out in Mission Frontiers that talks about this, that will be the major piece. I'm not making a big deal out of it between now and, and January when that article comes out. Um, it's a little dangerous to talk about the future and kind of project out to the future. You know, you've got the old Wall Street saying past performance is no guarantee of future results and all that kind of stuff. And, and I have been very, very low, partly because as soon as I start talking this way, somebody says, and then Jesus comes back. Please do not say that. Okay. Not when you're promoting movements, not when you're talking about movements, not, not any of those things, right? Don't, don't say, and then Jesus comes back. Yes, we want to hasten the day. Yes, we do this in part because of Matthew 24, 14, but we do not put dates on things, okay? So that's one of the reasons I've avoided this. However, I think it is important. It is very inspiring, but it is also uh, a little chilling to think about where this future could go. Now, in the past 30 years, we have seen enormous wild cards. We've seen wars. We've seen rumors of wars. We've seen pandemic disease. We've seen massive persecution. We've seen the growth of surveillance. We've seen rampant materialism. We've seen widespread nationalism. We've seen all sorts of things in the political realm that, you know, disturb people and, and make people wonder, you know, are you a Christian? Am I a Christian? Is she a Christian? All these kinds of things. Lots of wild cards that have happened. And yet these movements have continued to grow even in the midst of, and sometimes because of that turmoil, right? So we've had a lot of stuff thrown at movements in the last 30 years. And if 
we continue to have a lot of stuff thrown up, thrown at us in the next 20 years, might we not see the same kind of growth? Okay, well, if that is the future, then this would basically be the projection. In 2035, we would have another 10X point. And in 2045, we would have another 10X point. Now, let me give a caveat. If only there were enough people in the world for this to happen. The World Christian Database estimates that there would be 3.5 billion Christians in the world in 2050. That's their long-term projection. 20% growth, not even 23, let's just back it off. 20% growth would be 3.5 billion disciples in movements in 2043. Would basically double Christianity at that point. The UN estimates... 9.7 billion people in the entire world by 2050. 20% growth would reach 70 billion disciples in movements by 2050. Well, okay, all right. So it's math, and we're, we're extending the math out very, very far. And, and why would we do that? Obviously, you can't have more disciples than you can have people unless aliens start to arrive, which, yeah, I mean, that's just ridiculous, okay? If movements continue to do even a conservative version of what they've done for the past three decades, what's going to happen is this. They're going to grow towards saturation points. They are going to inevitably start slamming up against very, very challenging barriers. Right? Political boundaries, ethnic boundaries, linguistic boundaries, but even more, boundaries of visibility. A lot of times what we hear is, I don't see these movements. I don't know. I, there, these movements aren't happening. It's because they're such small percentages of the surrounding population. But we are getting to a place where they will not be invisible, where they will not be small percentages. We are getting to a place where even now, in some countries, political leaders are suddenly discovering there's a lot more Christians than what they thought when they start doing election campaigns. This growth is going to be costly in terms of persecution, in terms of response, in terms of what the traditional church does, in terms of what the surrounding religions do. That's where we're headed in the next two decades. So out of the world's 240 countries, 39 have movements that with one 10x multiplication, that country would be 100% Christian. 90 have movements where with two 10x multiplications, the country would be 100% Christian. And then so on down, 50 with three, 27 with four, 17 with five. Four countries are less than one 10x multiplication away from 100% Christian right now and growing. Most of the world's 47 unreached countries are among, I'm not going to name specific countries because, again, I, I don't comment on specific countries, but you, you can know that most of the world's 47 classically unreached countries are among these 179 that are one or two multiplications away from 100% Christian, right? Because movements were born in the unreached world. Movements are multiplying. Movements are filling up the spaces. On average, one 10x multiplication is taking a decade. So that means that these countries, 39 plus 90 plus 50, those countries right there, in a single generation, in 30 years, could be completely altered and will completely alter the trajectory of the world when that happens. I'm not saying that that's going to be easy. I'm not saying that that's actually what's going to happen. You know, that 150 some odd countries will become 100% Christian. I actually don't think any country will reach 100% Christian other than the ones that already have. Um, I, I think we'll get close to the line, but we won't get over it. There's a lot of countries that are over 90% culturally Christian right now. And there's a lot of stuff around there. But I do think that we are going to see several countries go through uh, a saturation effect and Christianity becoming a lot more visible, disciples of Jesus becoming a lot more visible, and there's going to be a lot more um, interesting dynamics around that whole process. 
So let's plan for the long haul. Let's think about the long haul right here in America. If we doubled every three and a half years and you started with 10 believers, if you start today with 10 believers and you double every three and a half years, the left-hand uh, set of spreadsheets, the left-hand set of columns would show you roughly where you would be to reach a sizable portion of the American population, okay? It would be 2106 to reach 167 million people. If you started today with 10 believers, and you doubled every three and a half years. If you doubled every two, you would reach that threshold in 2070. So you do have to think about the long haul. Now, on the other hand, let me encourage you that the largest movement in the world got to 35 million, in, well, over 35 million between 1995 and 2022, it's about 35 years, uh, by simply growing faster early on. So you'll note, you know, from 2022 to 2030 is growth from 10 to 160. If, if that happened faster, you know, if you got to some of these thresholds faster, they did it because they had more people out sharing. They had more groups being formed. There was spiritual hunger. There were miracles. There was a lot of that sort of stuff happening. But there's a lot of growth that could happen quicker earlier on. It does not need to take, you know, to 2106. But this is an entirely doable, you know, worst case scenario, so to speak. I believe it can happen here in America. I've seen far too many instances where people said, oh, it happens there. It can't happen here. I've seen every single one of those instances be proven false, be proven wrong. I don't believe there's a place where it can't happen. And the reason I believe that it can happen anywhere is that Jesus called us to make disciples. And one of the commands of making disciples is to make disciples. Multiplication is baked in. He promised fruit. Obedience to the Great Commission yield, will yield fruit that the Father will gather. I believe that can happen anywhere. That No place is off limits to that. So I look forward to the day. You know, I've, I've already seen the sheets you guys have sent in. I look forward to the day. When there are more people than you could put on a sheet. I've seen that happen in other places. I believe it can happen here. That's really basically where I'm at. I'm happy to take questions or talk further or however you want to, to go from there. It's 2.45. I've been about 45 minutes, actually, maybe a little less, given the technical issues at the beginning. Justin, this has been great. Thank you so much. Wow. How powerful is this, you guys, to hear just about what God is doing all across the world? It's amazing. Justin, some questions have come in, so let me um, – I'll kind of sort oh, through. Oh, wow. Yes, they have. You guys have been active over there, haven't you? <laughs> and I'll feed some of these to you, Justin. Some of them are um, similar. So like the first question – well, let me, let me ask you a question first that I had written down. You already addressed it, Justin, but it's such a um, – it's something I talk about so much. I'd love for you to even comment more on it than you did earlier. And that is something you put on Twitter years ago that you probably know I put in the book. And that was when you said that a team of two to three can reach a hundred thousand. And that just, just that idea blew my mind. I don't think at first I understood it. You were explaining it a little bit more er earlier about the 50,000, a hundred thousand and getting a team among them because you've seen things multiply to reach that, but expand. What do you mean a team of two to three can reach a hundred thousand? And what should, based on what you mean by that and what we've seen around the world, what what should that tell us here in North America, many of us are in uh, Western Europe, about what could happen if we send a team to a place with a movement strategy? Yeah, that original uh, quote came from a uh, kind of a theoretical exercise I did based on a historical survey of things that have happened in the past and a theoretical exercise of how it could happen in the future that I wrote up in an article called uh, What's It Going to Take, which uh, is, should be linked on my website, justinlong.org. I need to go back and make sure it's actually still a working link there, and I certainly can do that today. Um, so the, the full rationale of that, plus some of the historical surveys behind it are there. At, at the time, it was basically... Uh, if I can unwind the, the math at the time, it was a team of two or three who raise up uh, 10 local leaders, who each raise up 10 local leaders, who are then able to touch um, each touch a thousand, uh, reach in and touch a thousand people. That equals a hundred thousand people right there. 
Uh, since that time, what we've generally found is that most of the movements that grow do grow to a natural barrier somewhere around 50 to 100,000. And then at that point, usually they are of a size. Um, in fact, uh, I was just uh, going through, uh, you're not going to be able to see this probably. You might be able to see it. Uh, this is the actual 2022 census for Afghanistan. It's actually a, a, a projection forward. Um, from the from the last census because they couldn't do a census in the war, but they've got a good methodology to it. So I'm going, remember spreadsheets, I'm going district by district through that entire census and updating my population numbers. And most of the districts in Afghanistan are in the range of 15 to 50,000 people. So basically what you're saying is if a team can impact a district and then the, once you've impacted the district, you start to run into some barriers. The next district over, there might be some political barriers to you know being able to go into that district. Um, there might be some linguistic barriers. Those are the kinds of things you start running into. And then movements have to uh, do the same thing that we do. They have to send teams. They have to intentionally reach out and cross those barriers. And, and that is yet another layer of challenge. That, that movements will face beyond the normal, you know, evangelize your neighbors. Now you have to send to, you, you sent to Jerusalem, now you got to send to Judea and Samaria. And so that's a, a, an interesting challenge for them. Not every movement surrounds that. Um, a lot of movements do, but it, it takes time and effort. But you can see a, a team can start and, and ex reasonably expect to grow to 50 to 100,000 members. Um, so the question becomes, how many hundred thousand population segments and how do we send that many teams? Because you don't want to wait for one team to grow up to a hundred thousand so that they can send, maybe send workers out. You want to seed out a lot more teams to get a lot more progress going. Love it. Thanks, Justin. Hey, two questions at the beginning. Uh, by the way, by the way, just let me mention very, very quickly, uh, sending can be just as strategic as, as going. If, if mm -hmm. you are called to stay and send, you could actually impact 100,000 to a million lives by sending people to start those movements. But you have to go about it just as strategically as you would do if you went. You know, you have to have, you have to make lists and meet people and encourage them and walk them through the going process and all those kinds of things. It can be just as strategic to send, but you have to do it strategically. Thanks, Justin. Hey, two questions about gaps, somewhat related. Um, Lily asks, how do you know what the gaps are when you're not getting all the data? Some people are not reporting their data. And then Brian's question is, if security is a concern, how do you report where the gaps are if the locations can't be discussed? Well, uh, identifying gaps is the, is the fun and ongoing and regular part of my job. And it involves me going to lots of places and talking to lots of people and and persuading them to help us out by sharing information. Um, and that is a challenge. Uh, there's a lot of places where we, you know, I'm, I'm coming to the place where I think that's a gap, but I'm holding that thought loosely because it could very well be that God is doing something there that I didn't know about. You know, until six months ago, I thought North America was one massive gap. Most of the states are engaged. I did not know that. And I was so happy. I've been so happy to discover that fact that most of the states actually are engaged. It's, it's amazing. Okay. So that's that's one thing. So you, you really don't know the gap is not a gap until you find somebody who tells you it's not a gap. And that's just relationship and pursuit of data. And, and that's, you know, it's detective work. It's it's part of the thing. Uh security. Yeah, this is why people do share with me is because we don't publish it on the web. We don't publish it generally. And we compartmentalize each region's gap list to only practitioners in that region. We don't share South Asia's gap list with East Africa. We don't share East Africa's with West Africa. It only goes to the people in the region. Um, and and they, they understand the security issues. They're not going to be sharing it widespread all over the place. So we're not like Joshua Project or some of these other, I mean, I, I'm not saying that critically. I love JP. I, I know the guys there work with them all the time. They're very public and, and that's good because it's inspirational, but we don't put, because if you had the gap list and you had the list of all the provinces, it's very short work to reverse engineer to 
a work among list. So we avoid that. that. That's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Thanks, Justin. That's helpful. Hey, uh, David asked a question and Tim said he loved the question. So I'll ask it. So it's a question they both have. What do we know about the second biological generation disciples in countries whose children grew up in movements? It's a critical question. It's one that not very many movements at all are asking uh, right now. Um, most movement growth is growth by a conversion, not by birth. But that that has changed in some of the movements, and it will change in nearly all the movements in the next 10 years, and it will become a huge factor. Uh, and so we don't know nearly enough about that at this point. Uh, when I'm doing perspectives, uh, one of the things I do is global religious dynamics. And one of the interesting things is that globally speaking in the church today, 45 million babies are born into Christian homes every year, 15 million convert in. So babies are three times conversion. Um, and actually defections are about 12 million per year in the traditional church. So we're really only net uh, about 13, uh, about 3 million. So babies are actually about 10 times net conversion. Uh, it is absolutely critical for the church to help believers marry believers and raise believing children. And in fact, in many countries around the world, one of the reasons the church is, is having difficulty is that a lot of the believers do leave the country, either because of persecution or because of economic conditions or whatever. Um, and so you, you don't have enough believers who could marry believers. And it's, it's a real challenge. It's real difficult. Uh, so you, you, we do need that. And we don't know as much as we should yet. <clears throat> Justin Bryan's asking, how, how are you defining a church in, in this research? And then Bob's asking, what is the largest unengaged cluster? I'll take Bob's question. I don't know it right off the top of my head. I could look it up and find out for you and uh, send it back. I, I'm not sure what the largest one is at this point. I would guess... No, nope, that one's engaged. That one's engaged. I'm not sure. I, I'll have to look. Um, it may be that the clusters that are that remain to be engaged are, are pretty small in, in population, uh, actually. Um, what was the first question again? Sorry. Church definition, just for that oh. number you gave of churches. What? How, how does that work? Sure, it, it, it's left up pretty much to the movements, and most of the movements basically will define a, a church in something related to, uh, oh, my brain just froze. Is it Acts 2? Um, I think it's Acts 2. It's, it's the one where they're all meeting in the houses and breaking bread and fellowshipping together, and yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, Acts 2, 37, 47, yep. Thank you. Um, so they'll they'll basically do uh, like DBS or or discussions around that particular chapter, and they'll say how are we how are we going to count a church? A lot of it comes down to you know uh, does it have to be a hundred percent believers? What's the ratio of believers to non-believers? Those kinds of questions typically. But then they'll also ask you know what are the functions of a church outlined in that particular passage? Are we doing those functions? If a church is not regularly doing those functions, does that mean it's not a church? Like how often do you have to baptize people? Those kinds of questions. I leave it up to the movements. They usually come up with a definition that's that's pretty close to everybody else, but they're not always exactly identical. And I, I just take the number that they gave that they give me. It's usually pretty conservative. In fact, there are movements that will under the, the, they'll cut their numbers by a certain amount of. Uh, Sometimes I have to tell them, look, you, you, you are understating what's happening. You, you really should be bold and, and, and profess the things, the glorious things that the Lord is doing. Um, you, you are you're understating what's happening here. Um, Justin, that's great. Thank you. Hey, Jim and David ask similar questions about this 100% saturation dynamic you were talking about. Jim's asking, what are the interesting dynamics when a country reaches – 100% or near 100% saturation. David's asking, um, is that a reality? Has it ever reached 100% of a large population without it being forced? Christianity. 
Well, I don't know if you'd call it forced, but there is one place in the world, at least, that is 100% Christian and can only grow by immigration or babies, and babies don't really factor into it. I wonder if anybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, I'd be curious if it appears in the chat window here. Um, there are several countries that are more than 90%. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. Um, there are several countries in the world that are more than 90% Christian of one variety or another. And basically, um, the way I do stages of Christianity is 0 to 2%, 2 to 8%, 8 to 32%, 32% to 90%, 90% up. It's a, it's a progression of doubling. So it's from 0 to 1 to 2, 2 to 4 to 8, 8 to 16 to 32. So I, I do that. And I do it because... It kind of helps with the gray zones around the 10% line, the 50% line. Are we over? Are we under? It's, it's easier to say, well, we may not be, you know, 17%, but we're definitely between 8 and 32, right? So it's, it's easier to put countries into categories. There are a number of countries that are in the 8 to 32 range. China is one of them, for example. And there are a number of countries that are in the 32 to 90 range, like the U.S., and then there's a number of countries that are over 90% Christian. When you're over 32% and over 90%, the game sort of changes. You know, over 32%, you're starting to talk about places where there's a lot of cultural Christianity and in movements, you are struggling as much with the, with the baggage and with the, the misunderstandings and with the widespread, you know, what do you mean when you say a Christian kind of things, right? Um, when you're over 90% Christian, you're, you're very definitely in the uh, heavy nominalism. Um, yes, of course, I'm a Christian. I'm whatever this, you know, I'm, well, to pick on one, I'm Polish. Of course, I'm Christian, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. So the, the strategy has to change in those different environments. Uh, I have not seen a country that has grown to saturation point with a with a movement kind of thing where um where it would be you know that dynamic uh disciple following jesus ready to count the cost kind of thing um i i don't know what a country that was you know even over 32 percent of that would look like i i i, I could scarcely imagine what that would be like um I guess we'll we'll find out eventually. Um, yeah. Thanks, Justin. Hey, would you guys help me uh, thank Justin for coming today, giving him a virtual round of applause. Justin, we'd love for you to come back regularly. This is so helpful. <laughs> I want to give you a final word. Just anything else you want to share to encourage the group as we continue uh, this pursuit. But um, guys, as you go to your breakouts here in a second, you're welcome to uh, discuss some of what you heard at the front, and then uh, coaches, as as per normal, will go uh, through our questions. So, Justin, any any final uh, thoughts? I think that the biggest thing that I would think about is it has happened elsewhere. It can happen here. God is the one that gives us fruit. I think what happens a lot of times is that the way that we work to identify the fruit, to harvest the fruit, to grow the fruit, we are often the ones, me, or I am often the one standing in the way. That the, the block is not the fruit growth, the block is the harvester, it's me. And so I would constantly be asking myself, what is there? in me, what is there in the way that I am working, what is there in the way that I am discipling and mentoring others that is in some way slowing this process down? Three and a half years to double. Can the time to double be cut if I were to do something different? If I were to stop doing some things I don't need to do? If I were to start doing other things I need to do? What is there that, that God show me what in me could be crucified and would stop slowing things down? Now, I'm not saying that's always the case. God has his timing. But I think it's always worth asking the question, what is there in me that needs to die 
so that seed can grow up. I think that's what I would say. <laughs>